Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. There's one thing I truly hate about my job, getting a late night phone call. When it comes, it only means one thing, murder. I've been a homicide detective for over 20 years, and I've witnessed the darkest depths of what a so-called civilized man can do to another. Oddly enough, my time in the Marines was less bloody. Yes, it was war, and we killed. But the real cruelty is here, at home, among our own people. Retirement's coming in less than two weeks, and I'll welcome it like I do my wife every night. My wife. She's an incredible woman, full of passion, and these late-night calls trouble her more than they do me. This one, though, seems to affect her even more than usual. Probably because she hoped the last call really would be the last before I retired. She wanted my career to end without another homicide weighing on us. My wife had only been in bed with me for a few hours. She had a rare girls' night out, with several of her friends. They don't go wild at some meat shop trolling for men or get stumbling drunk. A few of them get together now, and then just to clear their heads from the mundane day-to-day -day life we all have. All of her friends are cream of the crop women that grew up together. Each one of them are in long-term marriages, just like me and Kathy. When I was given the particulars of the call, I knew this one was trouble. Kathy knew from my expression is wasn't good. Who is it, Leon? I looked at her having trouble believing it myself. It's Brian and Nancy White. At one time we were fairly close to each other. We were neighbors when the kids were small, but after they moved away, we all got busy with our own careers leaving little time to maintain the friendship we once had. It had to bad for my lieutenant to call me out when I was so close to retirement. Kathy watched me get dressed with a look of apprehension on her face. If I didn't know better, I think she may have known something. I was in cop mode by now and had a job to do. Okay Kathy, spill it. You know something, I can tell. You and I have been together too long to start hiding things from each other. What do you know? I don't know anything, Leon. When I gave her the look I usually do when I know she's holding something back, she decided it best to give it up. Okay. I saw Nancy last week having lunch with some guy, and it seemed to me they were awfully friendly with each other. They were too friendly if you get my drift. How come you didn't mention that you talked to Nancy last week? I figured you would have caught up with her and seen how she and Brian were doing. I told you she was too friendly with the guy she was with, and I didn't feel comfortable talking to her. What she was doing with the guy wasn't right. It was a disgusting display. Even from a distance, it gave me the creeps. What did this guy look like? Early to mid-thirties, well over six foot, short blonde hair, dressed in a gray business suit. Anything besides them acting inappropriate bother you about them? Trust me, honey, that was enough. You know how I feel about cheaters. Asking Kathy any more about what she witnessed between Nancy and this guy would have been useless. When she said, cheaters, it was over. Throughout the years, we have both seen too many marriages fail because some damn idiot, male and female, decided that their wedding vows no longer mattered. We both despise cheaters and believe they deserve what they get when they get caught. I did, however, believe murder to be a little excessive. I gave my wife a kiss and headed out. As I pulled up to the White Household, I noticed the coroner beat me there and was already busy with the bodies. Walking up to the house, there were several uniforms keeping the spectators away. They did take a few seconds to tell me a few old man jokes. Everyone knew I was shy of mandatory so, to them, I was an old man. My lieutenant was there waiting for me which was unusual. Guess he wanted to gauge my objectivity and my ability to do my job since I once had a personal relationship with the victims. He was satisfied I would be okay and in the long run he figured it would be beneficial having me on the case since I would work harder to solve their murders. I asked him how bad it was inside. He shook his head and handed me booties for my shoes. Taking a quick glimpse inside through the doorway, I could see the blood splatter already. Whatever happened, happened in the front room. I just finished putting on my booties when one of the rookie cops came running outside and spilled his guts on the bushes. A few of his friends gave him some ribbing, but for me, I've been there myself so I said nothing. There wasn't much to see after passing the threshold, but as I turned into the living room the scene set me back. On the floor was an unclothed male of undetermined height, suffering two shotgun blasts. His height was unknown because his head was missing. Well, it wasn't really missing. It was splattered all over the wall by the fireplace mantle. The second shot was made point-blank to his genitals. Whoever did this was seriously pissed off and was intent on making a statement. The second body was female partially nude and appeared to be in the process of undressing or covering up. She was killed with one shotgun blast to the chest, also point-blank range. Her heart was gone. I knew what this meant. The female victim was Nancy White. The male on the floor wasn't Brian. I knew that much. Even with his head missing the man on the floor was taller than Brian. Brian wasn't tall in stature, 
but he was always solidly built from exercise and construction work. He owned his own company and wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. He always preferred working alongside his men instead of sitting in an office. I respected him for that. Upon immediate inspection of the scene, it appears that Brian came home and took care of business in the only way he knew how. He took out Loverboy's good looks and removed the tool he used to take his wife from him. Then, since Nancy ripped his heart out, he returned the favor. The shotgun was dropped on the floor between the two lovers. The gun cabinet in the den across the hall was opened, and there were twelve gauge shells laying loose on the desk close by. A quick count determined the box was new with four shells missing. It wasn't hard to account for them. Three shots to the bodies, and one remained in the chamber of the shotgun. Brian's fingerprints being on the shotgun meant nothing since it was his gun. But if his prints were on the shells, then this would be an easy open and shut case. The box of shells was new. On the edge of the lid was a small mark of smeared blood. The killer more than likely cut their finger on the edge when they tried to pry it open in a hurry. Brian would have been very emotional at the time with his hands, shaking uncontrollably, while he prepared to shoot his wife and her lover. Determining if the blood was his belonged to the experts on forensics team. If I was really lucky, they would also find his bloody fingerprint on the trigger of the shotgun. If it turned out Brian was the killer, the district attorney would present the case as husband comes home, finds his wife with her lover and snaps. A simple crime of passion. Brian would most likely get a short jail sentence, but he'd still end up bobbing for apples with a prison buddy for a few years. It took several hours for the crime scene guys to map everything out. I headed home till it was time for my shift to officially start. Not surprisingly, Kathy was still up waiting for my return. I told her Nancy was dead and what was most likely her lover was dead alongside her. She came over to me and hugged me tightly saying, she will miss the person her former friend used to be, but not the person that would cheat on her husband so blatantly and so publicly. When she asked me about Brian, all I could do was tell her he was wanted for questioning, but that was all for the moment. Until the crime scene was fully processed, there was no direct evidence tagging him as the killer. After a two-hour nap, I drove to the precinct. The preliminary report would still take a couple hours, but I told the lieutenant I was headed down to White's construction company. He already had a squad car on site waiting to take Brian into custody when he showed up for work. I was hoping a friendly face might make things easier when he did. The office was already open when I parked the car. The patrol officers had already inquired about Brian and was told he was out of town bidding on a job. Brian's secretary had been trying to get a hold of him for the past half hour. Brian wasn't answering his phone, but she had been able to find out his appointment was delayed until later in the morning, per his request. The company he had his appointment with was located in Parkersburg. Since it was a long drive, he reserved a motel room for the night before so he could make what was an early morning appointment. I knew if he wanted to kill his wife and her lover, there would be more than enough time for him to drive home from there, commit the murders and drive back in time to keep his original appointment. So why the delay? It would have helped his alibi by showing up as originally planned since the meeting was scheduled early in the morning. Not doing so was more of a red flag to his involvement. Unable to make contact with Brian, it was decided to have the patrol car crews by regularly just in case he showed up. A call to the motel confirmed his check-in at 20.30 hours last night. I also called the cell phone company and pinged his cell phone. His cell phone failed to show up on the cell tower's locator. His phone wasn't turned off, it just wasn't. A phone turned off can still be pinged. The emergency locator function cannot be turned off. Either the battery was completely drained, or he removed it from the phone. My lieutenant approved the drive down to Parkersburg. If nothing else, I owed it to my former friend to show up personally and take him into custody for questioning. The drive was uneventful until I ran into some road construction. The damn the Department of Transportation has a nasty habit of an all-or-nothing approach to road repair. You're either losing your suspension in a pothole the size of a bus, or you're sitting still on the interstate waiting for them to figure out how to fill the damn thing. A simple two-hour drive turned into a three-hour cuss fest. And if the transport department kept to their usual crap, then before 1800, hours the road was restricted to one lane only, and then after 1800 hours, they pretty much closed the roads down while they looked busy standing around. To make matters worse, overhead utility lines were being run over the same section of road resulting in even longer delays. It was a scheduling nightmare for the state troopers. I really felt for my fellow law enforcement brothers. After finally making it to Baker's Realty Experts, the first thing I noticed was the absence of Brian's car. I checked in with the company president's personal assistant and was told Brian was there and currently presenting his bid to the board and had been in their office for close to two hours. The meeting was expected to end at any moment as the president had another scheduled meeting immediately after. 
There was a total of three construction companies that made it through the initial screening, and each were qualified of being considered for the general contractor's job. It was a very attractive bid. Bonuses were offered as an incentive to beat not only schedule deadlines but build quality as well. I asked for some of the president's time before his next meeting. The assistant went inside the conference room and came back with an approval for a few minutes, but nothing more. While waiting in the lobby, another general contractor came in to give his presentation to Baker's Realty. You could tell he was very nervous. If I guessed right, his skills were geared more toward the construction side of the business than schmoozing clients. He must have just come off the job because he was still knocking the dirt off his shoes and his hands showed the effect of years of hard work. Fifteen minutes later, Brian came out with a happy expression on his face, shaking hands with the president and board members of Baker's Realty. Needless to say, he was shocked to see me standing there, but he was able to keep his composure walking up and greeting me like the old friends we once were. Pulling him off to the side, I quietly told him to wait for me outside, and not to try leaving as doing so would be very bad for him. His face continued to show concern, but when he told me he would be waiting outside, I knew he meant it. My time with the company president proved beneficial. Turns out the three companies were bidding on a $5 million office building and a five-year building maintenance contract, itself worth millions. It was possible the build and the maintenance jobs would go to different companies, but all were to present bids for both jobs. I was told by the president that one of the bidders used to be a regional powerhouse until a few construction accidents and shoddy workmanship hurt their reputation. Now they were trying to regain the prestige they had before. He was a fair man and was willing to give them a shot at redemption, but he would be more critical of their proposal than he would be of the others. The third company was an up-and-comer with positive references. He doubted they had the resources for the construction side of the job, but the maintenance side was well within their ability. He was the underdog of the three. When I asked him of the prospects for Brian's company, he said that Brian and his company were the preferred bidder for the construction, but not necessarily for the maintenance portion of the bid. The president had his own concerns on why I was there asking questions about one of the men he was considering for a major build. I gave it to him straight. That Brian's wife was murdered during the night and as part of a normal investigation, I needed to confirm his whereabouts. He asked did I considered Brian a suspect. I told him, as a detective, everyone is a suspect until evidence proves otherwise. However, I explained our prior relationship and if he was the man I once knew, then no. I didn't consider him responsible for his wife's murder. That seems to satisfy him for the moment, but he asked that I keep him informed of any information that, while not impeding my investigation, would be beneficial to his construction project. Too much money and too many people's livelihood were at stake. Since I had a possible murderer outside, I couldn't stay away from him for too long. Walking outside the office, Brian was waiting by my car, just as he said he would be. What the hell is going on, Leon? Why are you here and why are you after me? It did seem that he was genuinely surprised by me being there. I thought after last night you'd have figured that out on your own. What the hell are you talking about, Leon? Nancy, Brian. You killing Nancy and? His eyes opened wide and his mouth dropped open in shock. Next thing I knew he had tears flowing down his face. He fell against my car barely holding himself up. As a seasoned cop I've seen every acting job a person can play to try and beat a murder rap. But here was a man who actually looked like he did not know his wife was dead. Leon, did you just say I killed Nancy? I couldn't kill her. I loved her. Past tense. Interesting. She was nothing but a cheating 304, but she was still the mother of our kids. I wouldn't kill her just for that. He knew. We have motive. Brian. Why haven't you been answering your phone and where is your car? I could tell he was still processing the news of his wife when he started to tell me about how he confronted his wife and her lover at his house. He said he didn't take it well that her lover was in his home, and he pushed the guy around a little, but that was it. He did tell her since the house was in his name only. He wanted her out and that she would be served with divorce papers as soon as he could call his lawyer. When I asked him again about his car, he told me he caught some line wrap from the overhead utility work and dragged it all the way to the motel he was staying at. That was the reason for rescheduling this morning's appointment. A local garage has his car, and he planned on going there directly from his meeting to pick it up so he could head back home. Actually, he was going to a motel for the few days until Nancy moved her shit out of his house. Since it would be part of the investigation and for the moment I needed to keep Brian in my custody, I drove us over to the garage working on his car. Sure, enough his car was there and per Brian's insistence they provided the written order detailing the time he dropped off his car and work they performed. The car never left their possession. As a courtesy the owner drove Brian over to his motel and to his meeting this morning. I told Brian we were going over to a restaurant so we could talk more and have lunch. At this point I no longer worried about his fleeing. 
There was enough preliminary evidence to show he wasn't the killer, but I needed to know about things between him and Nancy. For the next hour and a half, he spelled out what sounded like a bad internet cheating wife story. He was on the verge of tears throughout his telling. Seeing the pain in the eyes of a man I knew, on a personal level, magnified my dislike for adulterers even more. I've been a homicide cop for a long time and seen some extremely stupid reasons to kill someone. Like the guy who killed his brother because he ate the last pork chop. But here and now, I could almost understand why someone loses it and uses a shotgun on another human being. Sitting in that diner I knew I was retiring one month too late. I knew for a fact he was distraught over Nancy's cheating and her murder. No one is that good of an actor. However, as a cop I knew he could be distraught and still be the murderer. With our lunch over I told Brian that I was allowing him to drive his own car home, but that I would follow him. At the moment I had no direct evidence of his being the killer, and with his car in a garage in Parkersburg, I had no reason to place him under arrest. There was enough reasonable doubt. I called my lieutenant on the drive back and brought him up to speed. He advised me they still haven't identified the male victim. His fingerprints haven't showed up on any databases. The next few days involved retracing Brian's activities for the past few weeks and up to the time of the murders. During this time, the forensic accounts were reviewing the financial records of the three companies involved in the Baker's Realty construction bid. It was necessary to cover the money reason for murder. People kill because of passion or money. I was home asleep when I got another late-night phone call. You wouldn't believe the words screaming inside my head. This time though Kathy wasn't disturbed by the call. It was the night desk sergeant telling me he just had two patrols respond to a report of gunshots at a motel downtown. The room Brian was staying at was shot up pretty bad. He wasn't hurt, but terribly shaken up. He was being treated by the medics when I showed up. Glass shards from the shattered window nicked him up, but that was it. He was still in shock by someone trying to kill him, but refused a trip to the hospital. He instead asked to be allowed to find a safe place to stay before the person who tried to kill him came back to finish the job. I felt for him and thought about letting him stay at my place, but I wasn't about to put Kathy in danger for Brian or anyone. He would have to spend the night at the station house until we could make better arrangements. Later the next morning, Brian received the call from Baker's Realty on his new phone. His company was selected for the construction job, but not the maintenance contract. The nervous guy I seen in the lobby was the third bidder and his company received the maintenance contract. He was happy with that. He mentioned the president picked him not only because of his reputation but also because his closest competitor, Hughes Consolidated Builders, was putting unwanted pressure in his selection process, which he resented. Those actions became another factor in his decision-making. I knew the president of Baker's was an upstanding guy. He also liked giving the little guy a chance to prove himself with the maintenance contract. Forensics caught a break that linked the two shootings. They found a fingerprint on the door handles of both Brian's house and his motel room. The print belonged to a career criminal with a bad reputation. Getting him off the street would be a joy. While Brian began the process of setting up for the build, he received a few threatening anonymous calls and emails. While it led us in a different direction, it also gave us motive. This time the threats were against his company. The possibility of equipment failures, accidents, and fires were only a few. With Brian taken care of for the moment, I decided to start following up on the movements of Nancy. According to Brian, my wife, and a few others, it was obvious she lacked discretion when it came to her affairs. Her credit card purchases for the last two months showed a variety of visits to men's clothing stores, restaurants, and a five-star hotel downtown. Two or three times a week on average, she was out enjoying the high life with Boy Toy. In total, she ran up well over $6,000 in credit card bills directly linked to her and her lover in two months. Since the card was in Nancy's name only, Brian won't be on the hook for them. If he was, it wouldn't surprise me if he dug her up and slapped the shit out of her. Instead, he gets to collect the life insurance he had on her. That's another motive I had to consider. The lover's motel would be my first stop. I was hoping security cameras caught a good head shot of the guy. Our cyber guys could use facial recognition against the FBI database to help us find the identify of Nancy's headless lover. I was right about the hotel. They used high-definition video cameras at the front desk and caught the happy couple on a few occasions. It only took the cyber unit four hours to get an 85% probable match. The Fed started photographing everyone who crossed the border years ago. It seems a certain man with blonde hair, standing six foot four inches tall, crossed the border from Canada all of four months ago. As usual, the Feds kept poor records, but after a few phone calls, I was able to find out that he came over on an H-1B visa as a project manager. No wonder our guys couldn't find his fingerprints, he was Canadian and wouldn't be part of our regular database searches. But his employer here stateside was responsible for fingerprinting, 
criminal background, and everything else. Of course, that goes to the immigration people at ICE, who makes it part of the database. At the time of my inquiry, ICE was four months behind on scanning the data into their system. At least the Border Patrol tagged this guy crossing the border and called IC, who called the State Department, who emailed the Border Patrol to confirm his visa. So, one Victor Reynolds of Montreal crossed the border and after only four months of being stateside, he seduced a former friend and had his head blown off by an unknown assailant. I called and talked to a detective in Montreal to let him know one of their citizens were murdered and hoped that he could give me some background on the guy. It turns out that Victor Reynolds was a well-known alias used by a lowlife named Stephen Carlyle. He was a part-time performer for an all-male review in Montreal. When he wasn't doing that, he was trying to milk ladies out of their money by making them believe he loved them. He was a con artist. There were several arrest warrants out for the prick, but before they could catch him, he just up and disappeared four months ago. Now they knew where he ended up and now that he was dead, he was no longer their problem but mine. They even refused to accept the body for burial in Canada. I already knew who helped him with the fraudulent H-1B visa and in getting him across the border. If he came over for what I suspect he did, he was successful up to the point to where he had his head explosively relocated from his body. With the day over with, I went home for the night. My wife had made me promise to be home on time today so she could give me my retirement present early. As soon as I walked in the house the smell made my mouth water. She made my favorite meal. I'm a meat and potatoes guy mostly, but she has a recipe for Pacific salmon with sautéed vegetables that is just outstanding. The food makes your mouth happy. It sits lightly in your stomach so when you thank your wife with an after-meal romp, you're not weighed down and unable to perform. If the food was any indication of what my retirement present is going to be like, then I'll be performing for her for a long time. The meal was wonderful and when my wife told me what my real present was, I sat dumbfounded for a minute. She had siphoned off a few dollars from our paychecks for years and put it in a vacation account that would allow us to travel for the next six months uninterrupted. We always wanted to travel to Europe and visit her extended family in Italy, and now we can do it comfortably. Oh yeah, we performed for each other. The next morning, we talked over breakfast. Kathy wanted to know how my investigation was going, but I could tell her little. What information I could tell reinforced her hatred for the actions of her former friend. Cheaters deserve whatever happens to them, was a new statement from my wife. The more severe the adultery, the more severe the punishment, was another. I, however, thought using a shotgun to put a three-inch hole in Nancy's chest and dematerializing a man's head and genitals seemed a little excessive, but I'm a cop and that just means more work for me, obviously. All in all, I preferred a healthy dose of abject humiliation and financial ruination for any guilty party. At the squad room, the report from our forensic accountant was sitting on my desk. He reviewed the records of the three companies that were bidding for the baker's job. Murder was usually for passion or money. This is the money part. One company was a LLC in trouble to the point of bankruptcy. The company still had its backers, but it was operating under very tight controls. The other company wasn't incorporated, but was instead a partnership. One partner had a minor controlling factor in the company's ownership, but not its operations. The major partner essentially ran every aspect of the business. The Articles of Partnership allowed the company to be dissolved with only a two-month notice. The notice was intended to give the other partners enough time to line up financing to buy out the interests of the separating partner. According to court filings, that is exactly what happened a few days before the murder. If the remaining partners failed in buying the interests of the separating partner, the company is to be dissolved completely and its assets sold and distributed according to the financial interest of each. The accountant made mention that having only a two-month notice was very unusual. That normally wouldn't allow enough time for the other partners to line up financing. Considering who the partners were, I don't think they ever intended to use it knowing it would most likely destroy everything they worked for. Also, according to a different court, there had been another filing to dissolve the same partnership, but in an entirely different way. This action, though, was given to the clerk of court one day prior to the petition dissolving the business partnership. He knew it was coming. The filing in this court would automatically lock the finances of the parties involved. It essentially delayed the actions of any and all subsequent legal arguments. But since it was not a business transaction, the business partnership could continue to function until the court made its decision. This court filing was used to protect the petitioner and to infuriate the respondent. The third company was financially sound, but with much less cash flow. It was a simple partnership with equal interests of ownership. This one though had none of the crazy bylaws to dissolve the partnership like the previous company. Its cash flow was smaller but the partners were putting every spare dollar back into the company causing it to grow 20% in the past two quarters alone. 
The forensic accountant's reports confirmed the two suspects I already had. Right now it was a toss-up of who was responsible for the killing. Being responsible doesn't mean they were the actual killer. If I find one, I'll find the other. It was time to start rattling cages. Time was running short, and I wanted to finish this up before my last day on the job. I went by the office of the one company to talk to one of my suspects. The receptionist couldn't tell me where the man was, also telling me he's been acting strange lately. Sounded like he was getting ready to run. I drove over to the residence of John Hugh and parked far enough away to make sure he wouldn't notice me. While sitting there I observed Mr. Hugh and another man having what appeared to be a heated conversation. I recognized the man arguing with John Hugh immediately. There was an outstanding arrest warrant for the guy because his fingerprints were at both Brian's house and his motel room. Calling in for backup, I warned the responding patrol to come in silent. They made the radio call when they were less than one block out. That was my cue to roll up and surprise the Wonder Twins. Needless to say, one shit bricks and ran while the other reached for a gun. He suffered only a flesh wound. I called for an ambulance while the two uniforms cuffed Mr. Hugh, who actually made it about one half block. After a trip to the hospital so the doctor could put a band-aid on the idiot's boo-boo, he and I went to join the runner at the station house. I spent the next several hours in interrogation talking about current events. Band-aid man refused to talk, so I spent a little quality time with Mr. Hugh. It didn't take long before he spilled his guts. All over the floor. After his lawyer and the district attorney had a short conversation, a deal was struck. The information he provided virtually guaranteed his next 10 to 20 years would be spent in prison. He admitted he hired the hitman as a last resort because plan A ran out of time and he was outmaneuvered. He panicked and went to plan B. Plan A was hiring the Canadian gigolo to seduce Nancy. He figured Brian would get pissed off and do something stupid and get himself thrown in jail. After the articles of partnership came to light, Mr. Hugh knew that would be best. With Brian having to line up credit to buy out Nancy, he would lose the financial stability necessary to win the baker's realty contract. Even though Canadian Bacon did his job well, Brian did his better. He filed divorce papers one day before Nancy filed to dissolve the business. Plan B was the hitman. Since dead men can't win $5 million building contracts, he figured if he had Brian killed, he'd get the construction job. The interrogation of the hitman proved more difficult. He's been in and out of prison for so long he knew how to play the game. He was a non-violent offender until about 10 years ago when he went to the dark side. Since that time, he had served time for aggravated assault and was suspected of several strong-arm robberies. Only recently was it rumored he hired himself out as a killer. After being presented with the signed confession of Mr. Hugh, he admitted to accepting a job to kill Brian White, but denied even trying. Okay, I expected this a-hole to lie, doesn't mean I have to like it, but I did expect it. He had difficulty holding his breakfast when I told him we had his fingerprints at the scene of the double murder and the scene of a motel shooting. After the mention of a capital crime, he wanted to talk deal so he could keep the needle out of his arm. The district attorney was running for re-election this November, so he wanted a conviction badly and started to consider it. As an act of good faith, our wannabe killer provided information that seemed to implicate my other suspect as he had eyes on the individual twice that night. The second time was when he did try to kill Brian by shooting up his motel room. After knowing a hired killer was involved, the running theory was that Mr. Hugh gave the hitman poor intelligence on Brian, so he went in and killed our friendly Canadian thinking he was Brian and since Nancy was a witness, he had to do her also. Only after did he realize his mistake did he try to kill Brian at his motel room. But now after the man confessed to one attempted murder and giving information that could lead to the actual killer, I had my doubts. In case he was telling the truth about not being Nancy's killer, the DA agreed to the deal only if the information he gave resulted in a conviction of the other person or persons he implicated. Home was exactly what I needed after dealing with those two. Kathy knew how to bring me back to the land of the living after a day like this. She has always been the light in the darkness I walked in. The next morning, I drove over to the offices of White Construction to talk to my old friend. He seemed a little surprised to see me. I guess the expression on my face wasn't hidden as well as I hoped. I told him he needed to clear his schedule because we had more to discuss concerning his whereabouts the night of Nancy's murder. He asked if he could have an attorney present. After telling him that would be a good idea, he made a quick phone call and said his divorce attorney would meet us there. Odd it wasn't a criminal defense attorney. When asked, Brian reaccounted his activities on the night of the murders. Most had already been confirmed, but I wanted to see if his story would vary from his original statement. He pretty much kept to the script from before. Consistency is good. He had word variation but still kept to the same story as before. If someone was telling the truth, they pretty much did it the way Brian just did. Too bad he left out some important details. 
his attorney sensed a need for a change in directions. He laid an envelope on the desk which contained the certified reports and photos taken by the private investigator Brian hired to follow his wife. Needless to say, it was pretty damning. Brian had already told me that Nancy was cheating on him, but according to this report she was one cold-hearted bitch. Victor Reynolds, or Stephen Carlyle, or whoever you wanted to call him was screwing her blind for three months before he was killed. According to the report, he was only the last of several extramarital participants. Brian had her followed for the past year and knew of her affairs with just about every one of her lovers. The lawyer was trying to divert suspicion away from Brian to one of her former lovers. According to the private investigator's report, more than one of them were screwing hard. A couple of the lovers weren't none too happy about being discarded so callously. As my pappy used to say, any one of them could have held a grudge and wanted to take their revenge. The evidence contained in the envelope was going to be used in divorce court. He used adultery as a reason and named all her lovers in the action. They were trying to add another player to the mix. Bringing the conversation back to where it was before the attorney gave me the envelope, I told Brian it had been alleged by someone in custody that he had been seen leaving his house the night of the murders, and that the individual also described in detail the car he was seen driving away in. It was about that time Brian decided he needed someone besides his divorce attorney with him. I agreed with him, telling him to contact his defense lawyer. I had time to wait. While he was making his call, I went out front to talk to my next contestant. The shift sergeant already had her sitting at my desk. Introducing myself, I told her I was almost done and would be with her shortly. All I got in return was a nervous nod. Brian's defense attorney was busy in court for the rest of the day, so we would have to continue our talk tomorrow at the earliest. I wasn't worried about him being a flight risk, but still advised him not to leave town for any reason. Since I was still short on having any physical evidence, I couldn't arrest him. All I had was an allegation from a convicted felon whose story seemed hard to believe, but was beginning to be a bit more plausible. Brian wasn't expecting this turn of events, nor was he expecting to see his girlfriend sitting at my desk while I led him out of the interrogation room. Both of them looked at each other then at me thinking they were in big trouble. Well yeah, I'm investigating a double murder. Why else would you be here? The conversation I had with his girlfriend, Lydia Harper, was enlightening. It seems they have been an item for only about six months. She admitted she was in love with Brian and more than once begged him to end his marriage so they could be together. Their liaisons were few at first, but with Brian admitting the end of his marriage was close, they upped their meetings to twice a week, but still very discreetly. She didn't understand the need to keep their relationship quiet since Nancy was screwing around herself. Wonderful. She knew Brian was married and had no problems with screwing him. What is with these people? I've arrested serial killers that had better morals. According to Lydia, Brian called her the night before his meeting needing her help. He forgot documents essential to his presentation with Baker's Realty in the morning and with his car being in the shop, he needed a ride home to pick up them up. Since Nancy wasn't expected to be home, it would be safe for her to go to his house with him. However, when they pulled up she knew there was going to be trouble. Not only was Nancy home, but she was entertaining her lover. Brian was furious. He accepted the fact that his marriage was in name only, but how dare she bring her boyfriend to his house? He went storming in and confronted them both. She couldn't make out what was being said beyond the yelling. She did see Brian push Nancy's boyfriend a couple times, but that was all he did until Nancy got between them. To Lydia, it looked like Nancy didn't want Brian to hurt the guy. Brian took a moment looked at them both, turned and walked away. A minute later he came out with the papers he needed. After few hours of dealing with ODOT and the road construction they were back in Parkersburg. According to Lydia, Brian's mood wasn't the best. Lydia said it was impossible not to feel his rage at Nancy for having her lover in his house. Since this was a very important business trip for Brian, she was never expected to spend the night with him. He wanted to keep his mind on the presentation and their future. Their future? They must have had plans. Someone with a suspicious mind would wonder if Nancy's murder happened because she was in the way of those plans. Another motive. She thought about staying if only to help calm him down, but his mood never improved during the drive. Brian was still furious over what had happened at his home. She dropped Brian off at the motel, kissed him goodbye, and told him to calm down and concentrate on the presentation. It was just a little before 10 p.m. before she drove back. Did I believe her? My gut says she was telling me the truth, and it's normally spot on. She waived her right to counsel and did not hesitate in answering any question I had. But there was something bothering me about her hands. There was something missing. Without that little piece of circumstantial evidence, I didn't have enough to request a court order for a blood sample, nor enough to hold Lydia. Right now, all I had was her being in the wrong place with the wrong person at the wrong time. 
Even the hitman said she stayed in the car. If I can prove Brian was the killer, then she could be charged with being an accessory after the fact, but that was about it. The next morning, I hoped the latest forensics report had two items that would wrap up this investigation and I could retire with on a positive point. Fingerprints and a DNA match from the blood found in the shotgun shell box lid would do it. Of course, it wouldn't turn out that way. There were no usable prints on the box or on the shotgun trigger, and the blood didn't match any DNA on file. The lab techs were able to type the blood and distinguish it as belonging to a female. That was the good. The bad was there were no other distinguishing markers. Even the blood type was extremely common, type O+. A DNA match would have wrapped this case up nicely, but with the absence of that, I needed evidence from another source implicating one of the other players. Then I, I could get a court order for the courts to demand a sample for DNA testing. It was obvious the killer used rubber gloves. They did, however, cut their finger on the edge of the box of shotgun shells, leaving just a small amount. The cut wasn't bad enough to tear the glove away from the finger, so it was exposed to whatever they touched. Since this investigation started, there has been only one female implicated, and she did not have a cut on her finger. That's what was missing on Lydia Harper's finger. If she was my killer, she would still have evidence of the wound from the box edge. It was still too recent to have healed completely. As we all know, Paper cuts don't heal quickly. I looked over the interviews from the officers who questioned the patrons at the restaurant where Nancy and her lover died before they were killed. All who witnessed the two love birds thought they should have been hosed down with cold water. One woman especially was very displeased with the disgusting display the lovers put on that night. This patron voiced their displeasure quite vehemently, as noted by the officer who took her statement. According to the officer's report, she used some very colorful language as to how the adultering fornicators should be punished. The woman mentioned in the report is well known to everyone in the department and extremely well thought of. I know her as well and I noticed she has had a Hello Kitten band aid on her index finger since the night of the murders. That itself meant nothing to my investigation. There had to be evidence showing her involvement with the killings or that put her at the house the night of the murders. No judge would give me a court order just on speculation. Hell, according to the contract killer, no other woman besides Lydia Harper was in the neighborhood that night. I had to either get lucky or accept that I couldn't solve this one in time. But you can only build a case against an individual with evidence, and we had absolutely nothing pointing toward this person. My gut was telling me this person was our killer, but all I could do was follow the evidence. I worked this case and did my best, but I knew it was over. When my time was up and I handed my badge over to my lieutenant, I would no longer be a cop. I wouldn't care if this person confessed to the me one hour later. I wouldn't care. One minute after 1500 hours, I would Kathy's husband and nothing more. Tomorrow, I had to bring my replacement in on the case and sit with him and review all the evidence compiled so far. I've known Sean Wilkes for years, and he is an extremely capable detective. After I told him all my suspicions and his review of the forensics, he took up the active investigation of the case. Two days and I'm done. Sean Wilkes was now the lead investigator even though I was still the detective of record. I sat in with Sean while he talked with the DA about the case and I clarified issues as needed. Of course, the blood test showed our hitman wasn't a match to the blood found on the box of shells and the trigger, so he wasn't responsible for killing Nancy and the Canadian thing. A video from an ATM across the street from Brian's motel room showed he was guilty of that crime, so he was at least going away for attempted murder and a slew of other charges. Guess he was telling the truth. He didn't gain any points for implicating Brian White and Lydia Harper since the forensics report proved Brian wasn't the killer. As Lydia Harper goes, there's just not enough circumstantial or physical evidence showing she did it. Detective Wilkes decided to look closer at Lydia Harper to see if he could find that missing piece. It only took a few hours for him to clear her as well. She had stopped at a Denny's on the way home from Parkersburg for some food. The date stamp on the receipt showed her there at the time of the murders. So, we had a murderer running free, and we had nothing definitive as to who she was. My career was going to end not being able to solve a double murder. That was a negative. However, I was going into retirement by putting a contract killer and the guy who hired him away for a long time. For me, that was a positive. Even if Nancy was a cheating skank, I wanted to solve her murder because the law says she deserved justice. The part that irritates me is, deep down I knew who the killer was. But I knew the law and violating a person's constitutional rights especially when I'm about to retire, wasn't going to happen. So, what could I do? Brian's divorce lawyer and his defense lawyer weren't wrong arguing a number of people had motive to kill Nancy. Detective Wilkes would need to look at the list Brian's private investigator compiled and see if he could make a case against any of them. 
I however had the feeling this was going to turn into a cold case, and it would remain that way unless the killer made a mistake and handed us the physical evidence needed to convict her. I looked at the clock, realizing my next to last day was done. I went home and hugged my wife. We spent a quiet night together cuddling, both of us hoping the next 30 years would be just like this. I woke up in the morning to the smell of coffee. My last day would involve noting more than sitting in the office. I was done being a homicide detective. Kathy sent me off with a sly little smile. She knew this day would be bittersweet for me. First because my career was ending, second because I was also going to be on the receiving end of a lot of jokes. Kathy and I both knew that at the end of my shift, I would walk away leaving it all behind me. Literally. This case had really put a bad taste in my mouth. Two former friends turned out to be adulterers. Okay, maybe the one didn't start until after the other. But why not separate, then divorce and start living again without turning yourself into what you despised most? I wasn't wrong about being on the receiving end of a lot of jokes. Okay, I didn't mind the balloons and cake. It was my going away present that hurt. My fellow officers whom I had served with for decades got me a walker to use in my retirement. You know the type, the same kind used by the old man in the movie Up? Would you believe the a-holes even put bicycle training wheels, a bell ringer and little girl streamers on the damn thing? A-holes. Needless to say, I loved it. I even gave it a try there in the squad room to a room full of laughter. It turned out that the idea was my lieutenant's and chief of police's idea. Actually, they said it was mostly their idea. Since I had already completed all the administrative work to collect my retirement, all I had to do was hand over my gun and badge. The gun was accepted by my lieutenant, but the badge was placed back in my hand by the chief. He told me my badge number was being retired in honor of all my years of service. This sentiment was completely unexpected and supported by all my colleagues with a round of applause. I actually got choked up a little while graciously accepting their gift. I did refuse beers after the end of day telling everyone I needed to get home and start being a full-time husband to Kathy. She deserved nothing less. Kathy's reaction to the walker was something I'll never forget. She laughed so hard she had tears running down her face. Eventually she said something about them actually doing it. I looked at her as confusion, not too sure what she meant. She ended up telling me, who do you think gave the chief the idea? But they were too worried of offending you but I told them to do it and I would soothe it over. Didn't I tell you she was the best? We were holding each other tightly lying in bed after a round of retirement sex knowing this is was just the beginning of a new life together. No more watching other people's grief after you tell them their loved one was murdered, and especially no more late night phone calls. It actually felt nice knowing I was no longer a cop. No more obligation to the law and the sacrifice that came with it. Like I said, I knew who the killer was. She had eyes on Nancy and Canadian Bacon the night they were killed. She hated the display the two put on and voiced her absolute displeasure seeing them act the way they did. Our killer being female was proven by forensics evidence caused when they cut their finger opening a box of shotgun shells. Her blood was left behind on the box and the trigger of the shotgun, but we had no match in any DNA file. The woman was not seen at the house by the one person arrested for his involvement in the whole mess. The killer knew who Nancy was and hated her cheating with a passion. The same woman was seen with a Hello Kitten band aid wrapped around her index finger shortly after the murders. And now, I don't give a damn. I was in bed with my wife. Kathy obviously wasn't done, performing. She's pretty spry for her age. I felt her right hand reach down and start stroking me. Her stroking was a little uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable because of the rough edge on that damn Hello Kitten band aid on her index finger. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like share, and subscribe.